continuing on, we're going to be talking about the shoulder joint. So remember, shoulder girdle more specifically refers to scapular movements. Shoulder joint, we're going to have humeral movement. And then we're also going to have some scapular movement in there as well. Shoulder joint connected to the actual skeleton via the sternoclavicular joint. There is scapular movement. I'm not going to read through an insult your intelligence. I'm not reading through all the scapular elevations and movements that are going to be occurring with humeral movement. You need to know these four bullet points right here, right? You need to know these. So the shoulder joint is going to have a wide, various motion and, and range of motion. So it's going to, in order to have such wide ranges of motion, we have to compromise some of our stability that kind of ends up resulting in a, a level of joint laxity that we don't really experience in, in many other joints. Because of that, and because of the, the kind of that golf ball sitting on the T position of the humerus and the glenoid fossa, we're going to have a shoulder joint that is prone to instability problems. So we can have impingement syndromes, which is something that you see often. We can have subluxations and dislocations that it can occur. Realistically, the shoulder joint is prone to these instability conditions. In order to have our mobility, we have to allow a level of instability to occur. If we have the most stable joint in the world, it's not going to have a high level of mobility. So it's kind of this, it's this play counterplay type situation where we have to allow for a level of movement, but hope that we don't over allow movement to occur within a shoulder joint. We're going to follow the same order as we did for the shoulder girdle. We're going to talk bones and muscles and joints, and then we're going to talk movement specifically. So if we're talking bones, we need to talk scapula, clavicle, and humerus. So if we're looking at the scapula, we're going to have our supraspinous fossa, which is going to be this, this smooth section right above the spine of the scapula. We're going to have our infraspinous fossa, which is going to be along the bottom side underneath the spine of the scapula. We're going to have the subscapular fossa. It's on the anterior side. We're going to have the spine of the scapula, just like we talked about in the last video lectures, right along here. We're going to have the glenoid fossa, the glenoid cavity, which is where the humerus comes in. We're going to have the coracoid process on here as well, um, which would be right here, but you can't really see it because it's on the anterior side. The process is actually coming off into the anterior direction. We're also going to have the acromion process, which is what you're seeing right here. And we're going to have the inferior angle of the scapula. We're going to, on the humerus, we're going to have the head of the humerus, which is going to be what interacts with the glenoid fossa, humeral head here, as well as here. We're going to have the greater tubercle, tubercle, and the lesser tubercle, tub tubercle, oh, good grief, Parker. We're going to have the inter -tub -tub oh, tubercular <laughs> uh, groove. I'm an idiot and I can't talk today. And we're going to have the deltoid tuberosity, which is where the delts are also going to insert here. When it comes to the glenohumeral joint, it is a ball and socket joint that is anarthroidal. So it's going to allow a high level of movement to occur. And it is, again, as you can see, it's kind of like a golf ball sitting on a tee. So it is a multi-axial ball and socket. Similar to the hip, it's just a lot less stable. But we have a lot more range of motion because of that. There's going to be a labrum, and as you can see, we have several labrums, but we're going to have a glenoid labrum, and that's what's going to be highlighted in this box here. And what the glenoid labrum does is it enhances stability by kind of adjusting the concavity or the concavity of the glenoid fossa. So it's actually going to kind of create uh, a bit more of a cupping action. So it, it's referred to as a buttress to excessive humeral head translation. It's going to try to control, well, I went through so many slides. It's going to try to control the amount of movement that the head of the humerus can actually have. You can have labrum tears. And when you have labrum tears, it ends up looking like a little, um, little like wafty, wispy thing that's um, kind of hanging off, if you will. We're going to have glenohumeral ligaments. So here we have a glenoid labrum, and we're going to have our 
glenohumeral ligaments. So we're going to actually attach from the humerus onto the scapula, right? So these are going to help to control anterior and inferior movements, and they're going to really try to provide a bit of stability, as much as stability as we possibly can get out of the shoulder joint, of the glenohumeral joint. With that being said, the glenohumeral ligaments are going to be relaxed. They're lax, and realistically, they don't tighten, they don't get taut until we start getting to extreme ranges of motion. So think about what a pitcher's arm is going through and how we're able to get through that motion. If we had really tight ligamentous structures, we wouldn't be able to put our arms through as, as, as much of a range of motion. So unless they're all the way at their extreme ranges and they're all the way taut, then they're not going to be providing a ton of support within that shoulder. So what I want you to see over here on the right hand side is an approximation of how much glenohumeral joint movement we have. So if we're looking at abduction, we're looking at about 90 to 95 degrees of abduction that can occur without shoulder girdle movement. So this is purely glenohumeral joint. So that would be starting in an anatomical position and raising up just about parallel to the floor, maybe a little bit more. When it comes to adduction, it's pretty much zero degrees, right? So we can't really adduct too much further past, uh, past anatomical, anatomical position without involving our shoulder girdle. Flexion and extension, very similar, very similar story. So in terms of extension, so this extension is going backwards from anatomical position, remember, you, you get about 60 degrees before you actually have a rotation of that scapula. If you're like me and you have really tight shoulders, then you're really not getting much extension before your, before your scapula starts moving. And then you have about 90 to 100 degrees of flexion. So arm lifting, right? Forward motion of the humerus for, for flexion. If you, again, place your hand on your scapula and try to feel how far you can go before that scapula starts to move, that's your glenohumeral joint range of motion. When it comes to internal or external uh, rotation, we get about 70 to 90 degrees of internal and external rotation. If you, Again, if you have tight shoulders like me, uh, you're not getting anywhere close to that. But in general, this is, this is the high level of range of motion for the glenohumeral joint for internal and external rotation, 70 to 90 degrees. Now, if we're looking at horizontal abduction and adduction, right? Horizontal adduction, horizontal abduction, you can see how you're not, at least in abduction, you're not going to get a ton of range of motion without that, without that scapula becoming involved, especially with what we know about the rhomboids and the traps. You're going to not get as, as much movement, and that's about 45 degrees of, of range of motion. And then in terms of uh, horizontal adduction, before that scapula moves, you get about 135 degrees. And then once you let that scapula go, you can allow, you actually allow yourself to come even further. We've already quickly discussed how the glenohumeral joint is prone to injury because of the laxity and the amount of movement that can occur and the way that the ligamentous structure is designed. And again, because that labrum is trying to cup the humeral head a, a little bit more than that glenoid fossa is able to do, you're gonna be prone to injuries, especially with the range of motion that the shoulder joint is actually able to go through. Now, with that being said, posterior dislocations are rare, so that that the, the head of the humerus slipping backwards is, is pretty rare. It tends to be that it's coming off the front end, um, but you do have posterior instability problems that do present themselves. For most of our athletes, and, and for those who are trying to go into physical therapy or athletic training, you're going to see that rotator cuffs are frequently injured. There's four primary muscles when it comes to the rotator cuff. You have the subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor muscles. We'll talk about the, talk about the rotator cuff later in this lecture. But essentially, their goal is to attach to the front, top, and rear of the humeral head, right? So we're, we're really allowing for 
that that fine-tuned motion of the humeral head in the glenohumeral joint. And it's that that insertion that's actually rotating the humeral head. And that's why it's called the rotator cuff. And they're mission critical to maintaining that position inside the glenoid fossa. And if one of those gets disrupted, then our position inside the glenoid fossa gets disrupted, right? So if you imagine, I'm trying to like rotate my hands. If you imagine that you've got the glenoid fossa kind of like this, right? And you've got the head of the humerus here. It's not as tight of a fit as it is the hip, right? And you have a labrum that's going to try to bring that in a little bit more. But then you've got muscles that allow for this movement of the humeral head inside of that labrum. And they actually control that humeral movement. GERD, not gastroesophageal reflux de disease, but GIRD, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, is actually something that you see in throwing and non-throwing shoulders or in or in overhead throwing athletes and even side throwing athletes, I believe some. But what you what you see is that there is a difference of range of motion in non-throwing and throwing arms. In the athletes that have a internal rotation deficit of greater than 20%, they're at a higher risk of injury. So what we what we try to do is we try to have athletes improve or regain their internal rotation ability by doing things like stretching and, and really trying to improve the range of motion to overcome that rotational deficit. Because if we don't, they're at higher risks of injury. So this, this table right here is going to be very important for you to, to memorize. And that's going to be pairing the last video movements with this video movements, or shoulder joint with shoulder girdle movements. And so as we go through this, we have shoulder joint abduction and shoulder girdle upward rotation. So as the humerus is abducting, you can expect to have a shoulder girdle or a scapular upward rotation. As we're adducting, scapula is downward rotating. As we're going through flexion, you're gonna have an elevation of the scapula and an upward rotation of the scapula, right? So you're actually going to lift upward rotation and elevate as you're going through flexion because you're allowing that humerus to come up. Extension, so behind, you're gonna have depression and a downward rotation that's occurring as we're trying to allow our, our humerus to go backwards. Internal rotation, as we're coming in, we're gonna have abduction. This, the, this is where it kind of gets a little bit goofy, right? As we're rotating our humeral head in, as we're coming in, our scapula is gonna be rotating out. It's gonna be moving away from the vertebral column. External rotation, we're gonna be doing the opposite. That scapula is gonna be coming towards the vertebral column as our humeral head is going through external rotation. Horizontal abduction or adduction. In adduction, you're gonna be having a retraction of the shoulder girdle or of the scapula. And with horizontal adduction, you're gonna be having an abduction, right? So as we're going through horizontal abduction, we're going to be bringing that scapula back towards the vertebral column as we're going through horizontal adduction towards the front, you're gonna be rotating that scapula out. So you're gonna be going through abduction as that scapula is moving away from the vertebral line, the spinal column. So when we start combining shoulder girdle movements with shoulder joint movements, we get a lot more range of motion. We're actually able to significantly increase the range of motion of the shoulder joint. So let's say that you have 180 degrees of total abduction. So you bring your hand all the way from your hip up over your head. About 60 degrees of that rotation is going to be accounted for by scapular upward rotation. 25 degrees of that motion is going to be due to scapular elevation. And then the remaining 95 degrees of that motion is going to be actually due to glenohumeral abduction, right? So that is going to be the deltoids pulling on the humerus all the way up and over. So now if you look over here on the right hand side, you're going to get again, glenohumeral abduction. And you can watch if you watch right here, you can see that her scapula is also rotating upwards. So you're seeing an upward rotation of her scapula.
AB duction, you can't really see it here, but you can imagine that that scapula is actually rotating inwards. Again, flexion, if you watch, you can watch that there's a scapular rotation and an elevation that's occurring, and then on the opposite side. Glenohumeral flexion, this is going to be a movement of our humerus straight anteriorly. We went over this for our first test. Extension, movement of the humerus backwards in the posterior motion. Horizontal adduction is movement of the humerus in a transverse plane toward and across the chest, whereas horizontal abduction is going to be movement of the humerus in a transverse plane away from the chest or away from the midline. External rotation, movement of the humerus laterally around its long axis of midline. So we're actually taking and we're spinning the humerus inside that glenoid fossa. So we're actually rotating it towards the back. Internal rotation, we're moving the back towards the front. And again, we're rotating along that transverse axis. So we're moving it back towards the center line. Diagonal abduction, we're moving the humerus away in a diagonal plane, up and out. Diagonal adduction, we're bringing that humerus back in along a diagonal plane. So in the next video, we're going to start getting into some of the muscles of the shoulder joint.